Hello, everybody. Welcome to the HR Roundtable. Thank you so much for joining us today for having a great year creating psychological safety for the HR team. Definitely something that is so very important for all of us to really make sure that we're focused on. So happy new year to all of you. I'm PJ Trudeau. Uh, and I do a weekly roundtable and I'm so very excited today to have uh, Dr. Al Polizzi with us. Uh, she's a former HR executive who's now the CEO of Verdant Consulting, a top 20 workplace wellness provider for 2022 that supports mental health in the workplace through resiliency and psychological safety skills development programs. She's also the I. SO Global Liaison for the Occupational Health and Safety co-found for Sorry, Occupational Health and Safety, co-founder of the Kite HR Wellbeing app for HR professionals, and shares of the moment discoveries on all of these topics via the B Verton podcast. She's fantastic. We had her chat with us last month. We're so very excited, Dr. Al, to have you back again today. Let me turn it over to you. Thanks, PJ. And welcome everybody. Happy New Year. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how do we apply what we know about psychological health and safety to our HR teams um, so that you can create a, a vibrant and thriving team and workplace. Um, and so we're going to we're going to put our mask on first, as they say. Uh, and so as PJ mentioned, I was elected as the global liaison for ISO focused on psychological health and safety. So I bridge between the HR technical committee and occupational health and safety. Um, and that bridge in my mind is exactly the kind of thing we're talking about today. So we're gonna talk about what, okay, what are the basics of psychological health and safety? Um, how do I understand that uh, from a global perspective? Um, what are some known hazards for our HR teams? And then what are some tactics for addressing those hazards? Um, and so uh, thanks, thanks, Michelle, for posting, uh, looking to connect with others. I will definitely connect with you on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me as well. So when we talk about psychological safety, um, it has in many cases kind of become a buzzword, but the concepts of psych creating a psychologically safe workplace are not new. Um, this research, for example, by uh, Mary Van Cleek from 1925 looked at a, a flower factory and the transition from one management team to the next. And what she saw was a change in overall performance based on what the managers did and how they interacted with their teams. And so you can see here things like making a personal connection, giving context and the ability to make decisions about one's job, a feeling of job security. Those are gonna come back to us as we look at what creates a psychologically uh, healthy workplace. So in the 80s, we started to talk about more around charismatic leadership, how to be a servant leader, how to be, now we're talking about how to be a sympathetic leader or a compassionate leader. Um, a lot of them tie back to some of these concepts that have been around um, for a while. When many of us think about psychological safety, however, we think about the work that was done by Google in 2015 when they did the research to identify what made high-performing teams high-performing teams, and what they identified was these were these concepts of psychological safety, or we've seen Amy Edmondson's TED Talk or read her book, The Fearless Organization, that talks about the need for people to feel safe, to take risks without uh, being concerned about the backlash that can happen when we take those. Um, as I mentioned, I partner with the International Organization for Standardization or ISO. Many of us may know like ISO 9000 or things around supply chain. Um, ISO, you know, focused back during World War II on things like uh, standardization around bolts and 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 how um, uh, screws, the, the the different ways in which we can get the same sizing. So um, from there, they've grown to have standards across business, including uh, focusing on occupational health and safety. Um, so in 2021, they published something called the ISO 45003, which focuses on the global guidelines for psychological health and safety in the workplace as part of being an occupationally healthy and safe place to work. And so with that, they've really opened the dialogue to look at not just the physical safety of our workplaces, but also the mental health of our workers and our workforce. 
Um, if you haven't seen this, which I ha wouldn't have seen it myself um, if I hadn't been doing the research I do, um, it's available for free um, on the ISO website. Um, you can take a look at some of those guidelines. I'm going to be talking about them here. Um, this last fall um, in Q4 of 2022, the World Health Organization also published guidelines on what creates um, a mentally healthy workplace or psychologically healthy workplace. So when I'm talking about all of these concepts, I'm pulling from these global guidelines and how we can apply them to our HR teams, if that makes sense. So um, in addition to that, we also had um, a lot of research that's been done around what does it look like to be a healthy workplace for HR. I think I may have mentioned this before, but um, <clears throat> do we do you know? And in the chat, I'd love to get feedback. What function has the highest turnover of all the functions within our workplaces? Um, we have what the finance department, marketing, sales, uh, HR operations in the chat who wants to take a guess at the highest the function with the highest turnover i guess it is hr according to linkedin hr has had the highest turnover um, and when we look at this mckinsey study that was done uh, on um turnover uh these are the the co main causes or reasons why people were leaving i would look at a lot of these and say psychological safety right having caring and inspiring leaders that's what's required to have a psychologically safe workplace lack of meaningful work all of these are known hazards to mental health at work yes sarah and it's not surprising we have the turnover we do because we're burned out um, in addition the perception of hr and the role that hr um, has uh has been having the perception that we have within uh, workplaces can cause that turnover to happen. Um, so uh, let's do a quick check-in on how well and how psychologically safe your HR team is. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through a series of questions. Whatever is the most helpful for you to think about um, as you think about creating the best year ever for the HR team, um, you can think about either the HR team that you manage or if you're part of a larger HR team, the HR team you're a part of, um, whatever works for you to have this be a helpful time um, that you're devoting to thinking about psychologically safe workplaces. So um, I'll have you kind of picture that in your head. What team am I thinking about? And then we'll go through the questions. All right. So um, on a scale from one to five, um, people on this team reject others for being different. So if that's very often, that's a five. If that's never, that's a one. So um, rejecting people for being different. Questions or concerns um, are raised privately. Uh, and you don't need to share this in the chat. We're going to calculate these all together. Thank you, Renee, though. Bonus points. Um, uh, you're going to calculate these and get a score at the end. So um, just context. Okay, so question or concerns are raised privately to avoid creating issues. We prefer what is known and proven instead of trying new things. The team avoids speaking up when they have a different opinion. And I know as HR professionals, we tend to think about the organization. We're just focusing on our HR team. Oh, sorry. If you make a mistake on this team, it is held against you. When we raise problems, it looks like we are challenging decisions or somehow threatening. Asking questions looks like you don't know what's going on. Mistakes are seen as a lack of proper planning and are to be avoided at all costs. We are too busy to make time for questions or concerns in our meetings.
We prefer people with similar backgrounds on our teams. Risks are analyzed with excruciating detail. Conflicts become personal or create grudges. Okay, add them up. If you feel comfortable if you, uh, sharing your total in the chat, uh, that would be great. Um, you want to pay particular attention to any question that you gave a five, because um, as you'll see, all of those are components of creating a psychologically safe workplace. Um, and in, in creating our best year ever, that's the foundation we're going to build. Anyone uh, feel comfortable sharing their, their score? 19, oh, that's fantastic. That's a great foundation to build on. That's great. We are gonna have our best year ever. Okay, Renee, we've got some work to do. <laughs> Um, and this is, a, you know what, there's no judgment here, right? People have been doing the best they can with what they have. Um, but this gives us insight into where you're starting from. So um, these are the uh, six behaviors that are um, have been identified as being a psychologically, recognizing a psychologically safe workplace. So psychological safety is the belief that you won't be punished or shamed or have negative fallout as a result of speaking up, asking questions, raising concerns, or making mistakes. I did. I do a lot of talks on psychological safety, so here's one of the quotes I like to share with folks. Psychological safety doesn't mean it's never scary to raise a counterpoint or speak up, right? So it just means that you don't believe that the people around you will automatically reassess their value or interpretation of who you are as a person. You know, it's the ability to speak up knowing that the basic assumption that others have about who you are remains intact. Meaning, if my basic assumption about you is that you are genuinely a decent person who is a team player, is trying to do the right thing, and is genuinely trying to understand and move our organization forward, then you might make a comment here or there, suggest an idea that's a little off the wall, or maybe it's not really accurate. And I'm not reevaluating that basic assumption of you. And I think that's really at the heart of what psychological safety is. So um, the reason why I want to talk about defining it is because I've been in um, presentations or um, at events where I hear comments like, oh, well, we don't really know how to define psychological safety or it's just a buzzword or it's not really clear. Um, it's actually really clear and well documented what the specific things are that create a psychologically healthy workplace. And so based on those global guidelines from the World Health Organization and the International Organization for Standardization, um, I've created this model here, which for my simple brain is easier for me to keep track of, which is psychological health is based on understanding the history of my organization and the structures, environment, and expectations of behavior that exist. And so we're going to talk about each of those three elements. All of those come together to create um, our culture of a psychologically healthy um, and safe workplace. So I'm going to go through those um, in more detail. And I want you to think about your team, your HR team, um, and how uh, this may or may not be working for you or against you in having your best year ever in 2023. Why would I care so much about psychological safety? Is it just because it's a hot topic? The answer is absolutely not. Um, in fact, when I started this journey, I was uh, definitely eye rolling when it came to psychological safety because one, I'm a Gen Xer and I like, we didn't have that in my day. So what does anybody need it? Well, because the reason, shows us that that's actually what makes organizations thrive. And I'll share some data points with you, just some of the many research studies that have been done around how do we create 
um, a healthy workplace. So psychological safety, number one, helps increase creativity within teams. Um, and this was a study that was done. Everything I'm sharing with you, most of it has been done in the last year, at least post-pandemic or during the pandemic. So um, th this is in our new world of work as well. So an increase in creativity. In the chat, curious, what are some ways in which HR teams need to be creative? Or if you want to go off mute, that's also an option. Although there's 50 of us. Company events, yes, hybrid, doing a lot with a little. Oh boy, Frankie, that is like, I think we need t-shirts that say, you know, does a lot with a little. Uh, that's basically what we do. Um, improving processes, yes, getting to root cause analysis, um, creatively solving talent and resource issues, culture issues. Nothing's black and white in the world of um, HR, dealing with multiple personalities, sometimes in the same person. Uh, recruiting and tough, <laughs> thank you, Julia, for backing me up on that one. Um, yes, recruiting in tough markets. We have had to be on our toes and be creative the last three years because this is all uncharted territory. So being creativity, creative is definitely core to our work. Another one. When we have psychological safety, 67% more likely to apply new skills when it's psychologically safe. Why do you think that might be? Why do I need psychological safety in order to try new things? Yeah, the ability to fail. If I tell my kids, I tell people all the time, if you're not making mistakes, that means you're not trying something new, right? Um, managing risk, applying new skills. Um, if we have to upgrade systems in order to be, uh, in order to move our organization forward, but I'm going to resist learning it because I don't want to make mistakes, then, you know, those projects aren't going to be successful, right? And feeling safe if it doesn't work out. You know, if I tried and I failed um, in an unsafe workplace, I'm not telling anyone that. Right, I'm going to be afraid to try. So, uh, here I thought this was a fascinating insight from McKinsey. I got this uh, the study from them. Uh, curious, what percent of employees do you think would speak up? Or let me put it differently, what percent of employees see no reason to say something if they see something wrong, or and it's the same number see no reason to say something if they have an idea to make the business better. What percent of people are staying silent? In the chat, what are your guesses? 80%, 80, yep. Okay, these are high numbers, right? These are high numbers. Uh, some of us are, are optimists, 20 or 30%. It's actually 70% of our employees are keeping silent. Okay. Imagine if we were to be able to unmute them and create a space and think about that within the HR team. How many of us within HR feel like we can't speak and say what needs to be said because of the politics of it? But that's our job is to be truth tellers. So imagine creating a space in which we can be those truth tellers. Um, 70% of, uh, so psychologically safer organizations have a, almost a 70% higher performance in their outcomes, according to this study, um, from in the frontiers of psychology that came out last year, um, as well as increase in learning behavior. So it's behaviors that seek out learning. Um, if I were still in my old company, the psychological safety score would have been high. Sarah, that's so fantastic to hear. And I'm sorry to hear about your new new one. Um, when we have psychological safety, uh, I won't belabor it, but we have a, almost a 50% higher likelihood of project success. Let's talk about projects because a lot of the work we do in HR is project-based, right? We're implementing a new system, a new process. We're bringing on a new team. We're onboarding a new leader. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Um, and so if we think about projects, one second. In some point uh -huh. of the history, uh, if we think about projects, right, a lot of times we put down milestones. Um, our change management is about knowledge. 
but we really need to think about the hearts and minds of our teams and ourselves um, in order to build uh, successful businesses and achieve the things we've just been talking about. So I interviewed Claudio. He um, is in Mexico and he supports organizations in implementing um, the standards around psychological safety because in Mexico, there are national requirements for having a psychologically healthy workplace. Um, and they are also national requirements in Canada. Um, so uh, spoiler alert, this may be coming to the US. But I love how he articulated it. In some point of the history of, of labor, of industry, we forgot that there are human beings working at the factories. Uh, we forgot, I don't know why, because maybe we need to be very productive back then and we treat us like uh, like machines and, and still we do. So so I think that this, this challenge that we have right now is to humanize the industry, to bring back that aware that we are human beings, that we have feel we have feelings, we have emotions, we have all this and and obviously obviously we can create something different and you know what where else we have human beings in hr <laughs> with emotions and feelings all right so let's talk about these the structure of psychological safety um and the work that we do yes thank you linnell um, so let's talk about the history. And I just want you to kind of, again, pause and think about within your team um, and your department, um, what's the history that's those old tapes that are still playing that may be undermining the ability for people to feel like they can take risks, ask questions, um, make mistakes, be them their authentic selves. So here are some examples of things that may have happened in the history of our organization that can hinder our ability to perform at our best. These are just some of the ones I have. I'd love to hear from, from you guys any additional historical um, kind of weight or overshadowing that may exist. So I'll talk through these. If you could share some examples in the chat, if you've had massive layoffs or massive layoffs have happened in within your industry, even that the history of that within the organization can have a long-term effect on the business and on people's willingness to take risks. Uh, negative press, history of the owner. Um, I've worked for owner-led or founder-led organizations where when the, when the founder does some kind of things and the, that don't agree with your personal values or that have created kind of a, a ripple effect within the organization, that can come up. Um, failed projects, we tried that once and it didn't work. That's like the least favorite thing that I ever hear. Um, but that is something that sticks with us, right? And therefore, we aren't willing to make those changes. Any other his historical activities within businesses that you can think of that impact the willingness of the HR team to do their best work? Yeah. Oh my gosh. The perception of HR's role in the past. Juliet, gold star. Yes. Um, I'm working with a, a client right now where they're going from a very compliant centric um, check the box HR to more strategic, cult, thriving culture, empowering people to be the humans that Claudia was talking about. Um, that lack of trust. Yes. Thinking we're not. Yes. That we're not employees. We're not human. Um having HR kind of go through the fallout or you know, like I said, I mean, th this whole thing about HR's role in the past versus the future, um, that's a big one for us within our HR team. And this isn't, I'm just going to give a, I said this last time, I'll say it again. This isn't about let, let's all feel bad about these things. This is let's be aware of these as hazards and try to mitigate the risk that those have on us. So some of the ways we can mitigate the risks, I'll talk about here in a second. But being aware of them and naming them is how we build our best year, right? We know what may be uh, coming along with us, what hazards may be hindering our ability to thrive 
and now we're going to build plans to address them. So failed projects is one of the ones that I, you know, I encounter a lot is we tried that once it didn't work. Um, and uh, I just want to see uh, how often do we think that that actually happens? How often do we think that we invest in projects and those projects fail? Um, so what percent, if, if I have three projects growing, going, how many of those projects do you think will fail out of those three? According to PMI, the Project Management Institute, not just, you know, me and my opinion. 25%. I can't do math on that. Two thirds. It actually is two thirds, Gloria. Gold star for you. So two out of three projects fail. According to PMI, like this is what these people do all day long. Um, that means, think about the cost of most projects. Most projects are expensive, resource-wise, um, people-wise, financially. These are big investments and two out of three projects fail. So basically well, what we're doing isn't really working. Um, so, and that can impact the psychological safety of the projects that come after them, right? So if, if I'm following a failed project, then the likelihood that I'm gonna feel confident that this is gonna be successful, um, it's pretty low. So here's some things you can do for your team. So if, for example, you tried implementing parts of your HR, HRIS or your ATS, one of the things I've tried and not been successful in the past is manager uh, owned um, activity within the system because they can't understand it or whatever the issue is. So explore root cause, right? Is the system too complicated? Have we made the process too complicated? Are we solving for the right things? Have we educated everyone enough? Um, really get into that five whys. If, if, if it's this problem, well, why is it that problem? If that's the reason, well, why is that the problem? Really get into root cause. Doing that analysis as you start your next project will help you maybe sever and learn from the past versus having it be an overshadow. Um, and the other thing is to practice something called acceptance. Yes, these projects fail, failed, and yes, this one might fail too, but we're going to do everything we can to be successful. We're going to control the controllables, and we're going to accept the things we cannot change. Uh, that one can be difficult for us. So that's a good one to practice. So what historical situations can create stress for you and your team? Curious. Um, the past on around uh, the history of HR. Um, are there any projects that, and has anybody else had projects that have started and not been successful? Um, is that just me and maybe I'm the root cause? <laughs> Anyone wanna share anything in the chat? No, because Sarah's had projects fail. Oh, identifying low performers. That's another one. Boy, that one sticks with you, doesn't it? Because they're still here. <laughs> okay, so that's historical. So as you think about creating your, yes, as thinking about creating your best year, what's, what's lingering from the past that we need to either let go of or learn from, right? So just take that moment to think about the historical context as you begin the new year that, that's coming with you. All right, so then, um, as I mentioned, ISO 45003, they talk about the psych psychological health and safety of your organization. I break it into these three areas. One is the structures within the organization, the environment in which you work, and then the expectations for behavior. So we're gonna go through each of those in more detail. Yeah, the, you can have all the trust and all the interpersonal safety um, and everything that, that that, that you can build yeah and and that's good like we're not that's definitely not a bad thing and that's worth building but unless you have the the structures the scaffold of work to actually execute and deliver and to surface mistakes and to and to manage ideas and to and to and to do stuff do that day-to-day -day real work you, you're not going to get anything done and and we're not going to feel satisfied and fulfilled and and we don't we're not going to have meaning at work we're going to feel stressed because we don't know what to do next and things like that so absolutely the structure and process of work is absolutely critical thanks tom for backing up what i said <laughs> 
All right, so let's talk about what do I mean by structures. Um, if you look at the World Health Organization's guidelines for mental health at work, if you look at the ISO, they're going to list the same things. These are called psychosocial hazards within the workplace. We don't need to be fancy. These are just the things that happen that have been scientifically proven to undermine the ability for us to feel safe and our mental health at work. So some of them include things like job design. Okay, we're going to come back to that one. Um, being clear about what kind of outcomes or behaviors are rewarded. So having goals that are aligned and understood. Aligned is important because if one team has one goal, another team has a different goal, and they're working at cross purposes, that just is a recipe for toxic work behavior um, and stress. Um, having operating mechanisms that include the ability to uh, raise issues, ask questions, make mistakes, have transparency. Do we meet um, to meet or do we meet to communicate? Uh, do we leave space for questions and dialogue and discussion and debate, right? Is it, if it's one way, it could have been an email. Um, the having clear communication and a way to escalate issues where people don't feel threatened, um, either publicly or privately. Having systems and tools to do our job. This is a big one for us in HR. Do you have the software, the resources, the systems to manage the work? Are you being asked to run reports and have quantitative analysis, but don't have the, the mechanism to gather that data or to give you the, the analytics, right? Are you expected to just what, do it on a spreadsheet? So investing in the technology that we need, the systems that we need. I mean, for many people, and I, I've experienced this myself, our HRISs are unhelpful, right? They're not very, they're not user-friendly. Uh, they're not designed to be user-friendly. Um, and so that creates a barrier for us. Having the resources. So one thing to think about is, do you have the resources to accomplish what you need to accomplish? We put in here about doing, you know, doing a lot with a little, um, is there another function in the organization where they would be expected to do that and have um, breakthrough um, outcomes? So again, this isn't so we feel sorry for ourselves. This is so that we know what's in our potentially in our way and what's how we how can we diminish that risk, right? Um, it may not be oh, we get to hire 10 more people. It may be with the people I have, here's what I can realistically accomplish, right? Um, and so being clear about that. But let me talk about job design because job design is a big one for us in HR, especially since we've had so much change in the last three years. And then there's uh, one of the big things is like lack of role clarity. And I can tell you in HR, um, I find I've been at small companies, I've been at large, you know, Fortune 100 companies. And uh, the definition of what HR does, where they start and stop is completely different in everywhere I've worked and even titles are wildly different. So you can easily find yourself in a role that you were HR generalist for 10 years and you go to a company and you're like, this is not what I know how to do. <laughs> and oh, this isn't what I expected. And or like you get hired for this job description and then you walk in and you're like, whoa, that's not at all what I'm doing. And that is just the reality. And so lack of uh, role Clarity can play, you know, a big part. And Al was talking about this before, but um, even just, you know, there's gaps in like what your skill set is. And so maybe your skill set is X, Y, and Z, and this role is either evolved to need A, B, and C, or maybe they thought they needed X, Y, Z, and they really needed A, B, C. And you're in this role, and you're like, I don't have the skills to actually do this. So I see PJ's comment about, you know, feeling comfortable putting up, you know, setting boundaries, um, setting expectations, pushing back. Um, for this to be your best year, take a moment and look at how has my role changed and am I clear about what good looks like and how success is measured and how am I set up for success? Um, because you deserve that, right? And um in order to do your best work, you need to have the resources to do, do that work well. Um, and so being clear about how success will be measured is one way to get there. Well, and you needing that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, right? What I'm sharing is that this is a known hazard that has been globally recognized by the World Health Organization. So this isn't you being needy. 
This is you being uh, realistic about what has been scientifically proven to either help or hinder the ability for you to perform. So uh, being clear about you know how you'll be measured, about what your role is, what the boundaries are, like get that down now um, so that you're prepared for 2023. And here's the deal. What we find is, and we often ignore this, that um, most of the strains on our work are less about, you know, the behaviors of other people. It's uh, almost 70% of the strains that we experience, the stress we experience is psychological because these things impact us as humans. Like Claudia said, we are not machines. We have all of our own biases, our own background. Some of us have some trauma we're bringing to the party. We've got perfectionism, imposter syndrome, lots of things coming up for us. Um, and so we can't pretend like that doesn't, isn't real, right? That is what we bring to the workplace. And so understanding that and understanding what the hazards are that hinder our ability to be uh, safe, um, that that's what we're trying to pay attention to. So employees with high role clarity are 86% more product effective and 83% more productive, right? So better outcomes by clear jobs. All right, so what do we do? Um, I love to use something called a DACI or a RACI. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. I'm sure I'm using it wrong, but it makes sense to me, which is who is the driver or responsible person? I like driver because that's how I work. So who is the person, um, you know, the social security number assigned to this project or this work or this function or this process, fill in the blank. So who's the driver? Who's the main person? Who is... Um, the accountable who can make the decisions, approve uh, investments in resources, changes in, in direction, um, et cetera, right? Who's the approver? Sometimes some people think they're an approver and they're not. Uh, who's contributing? Who are my key contributors I need to have uh, to make this successful and who's informed, right? So writing that down on a piece of paper and then having people go, well, I'm not an informed, I'm an approver. Let's have that conversation, right? Let's have that conversation up front. So that can be helpful in clarity, right? Um, the other one is even if we think it's working, let's find ways to make it better. Let's find ways to make it improve. Let's find opportunities to optimize and create effectiveness and efficiency in the work that we do. Because it may not actually be working. We, we may just be used to dysfunction. So those are some examples of structures that exist within HR. Um, the other one is resources. And I kind of hit on this one a little bit heavily earlier. I think it's important for us in HR to focus on having the tools that we need to be. Yes, it's uh, an acronym for driver, accountable, contributor, informed. So that's the DACI, driver, accountable, contributor, informed. So this was looking at the healthcare population. There's a ton of research on if I have the systems and tools, this is why this is on the best place to work survey, um, systems and tools to do my work. Um, it impacts my uh, psychological health. Um, and so a 75% increase in mental disorders for, for um, with, this was with healthcare workers who did not have this, the, the systems and tools they needed at the time it was PPE um, to be able to do their job. Okay, so we know that there is a mental health impact when I don't have the systems and resources to do. Think about the aggravation of when your system crashes or you have to re-enter something or those kinds of things. It has an emotional impact on us. It's not just, a, you know, a nice to have. The world has changed and threats typically aren't as clear cut as a lion in front of you. So let's take a look at how our brains respond to uncertain threats. When we're faced with potential danger or uncertain situations, we feel better if we feel in control. We find it harder when probabilities are changing rapidly. Often what we rely upon are these kind of simulation mechanisms where we try and imagine if we were to engage in different courses of action. But that's also often where biases can come in like zero risk bias, which might explain the behavior of panic buying. As humans, we have a strong desire for absolute certainty. 
So when we can't eliminate the risks out of our control, zero risk bias may persuade us to completely eliminate certain perceived risks, regardless of how irrational they may be. And the reason I want to share this is that for, for many of us in HR, th these all sound like great ideas, but if I can't get the resources to do it, now what? Right. And so um, that's where something like acceptance really comes in for us of what can I, what can I control? What can I influence? And what, what is something beyond my ability to do that? Um, not because of my ability, but because of how the business is structured um, and the mindset of the executive team. So Aligning and sharing on organizational goals, making sure we're all working toward the same outcomes, being clear about that um, is one way that you can create psychological safety for your team in, in this year. Um, make and set boundaries um, and prioritize the work. Um, oh, we have a new thing coming in. Great. Here are the things that I'm doing. What, what's going to come off? Uh, again, easier said than done. If the answer is nothing, okay, then. Now I can decide what I want to do about that, right? If, is this going to be healthy? Um, so what structures that exist in your teams uh, impact psychological safety? So I've been harping on HRISs for a little while, but are there other systems or processes that exist within the HR function that you think can um, impact our ability to do our work, our best work? Oh, job security. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, budgets. Thank you, Renee. Does everyone feel like they have clear goals? Yeah, immature leadership. Thank you, Juliet. Unethical or yes. Yes. Um, if it I don't know if this helps, this helps me. I saw a study that showed about 70% of the C-suite um, VP and above have symptoms of mental health issues. So um, it is not unusual to have leaders who uh, need some help. Workflow, yes. Approvals, oh my gosh, why? Why does it have to go through all these? Why are we going through all of this? Yes, the bouncing back and forth. Oh my goodness, Stephanie. I I see you. All right. So that's structures, right? That has nothing to do with people's behavior. That has to do with the, do we have the pieces in place in our organization to make sure we are functioning? So look at your HR team and see what is in our way and what can we, um, what kind of barriers can we try to remove? All right. Now environment. So environment is something that's completely outside of your control. Um, but something to be aware of so you can mitigate the risk of it. So let's talk, we'll talk about like immature leaders, right? If I know that I have that as a dysfunction, I can either try to change it or I can accept that this is how they're going to be and we can plan accordingly, right? So we'll know, for example, someone needs more time to respond to an issue or I'm going to need more time after I talk to that person because they really push my buttons, right? So being aware of those things that we can't control and then making plans around them can help set us up for success. So here are some examples of things that can exist within our environment that can hinder our, our team's ability to perform their best work. Um, there are things like shift timing, right? Working the midnight shift or the overnight shifts, um, those are sometimes called the suicide shifts because it has such a detriment on our mental health. Um, we can't not work 24 hours if we're a 24 hour business. I worked for 7-Eleven before. So I know we have 24 hour businesses. So now what? What do we do to help mitigate the risks as much as possible? One thing I see a lot is tunnel vision. So that's just keeping our heads down, especially in HR. If I just get through the today, I'm just gonna get through today. I'm just gonna focus on what's ahead of me. And as HR representatives and stuff, we have to know the triggers, we have to know the resources, we have to be okay um, encouraging people um, to take advantage of the resources. And you know what? And sometimes we actually have to force people to, to dial it back. A teammate of mine who experienced the death, but his way of coping was to continue working. 
That was his coping mechanism. It's like, like a drug for him. Um, and he's good and he's a super guy. And it just got to the point where no matter how super he was, we had to worry about him because he wasn't really worrying about himself in the way that he should. And I'm not trying to tell anybody how they deal with grief or stress, but he needed to be able to dial it back. I recently um, had uh, the opportunity to present to the Association for Change Management in the Ukraine. And it was after this session with, um, with Edward. And um, they kept asking me all these questions about how they can help their teams because the teams just wanted to put their head down and go to work. They didn't want to pay. They didn't want to think about everything happening outside the office, everything happening um, in their lives. And for some people, that's a coping mechanism, but it, it's in many cases, it is not a very healthy one, right? And so being able to take care of ourselves and set boundaries and recover um, is an important part of the work that we do as HR professionals, because many of the things we do are emotionally hard. And so giving ourselves the space to find the time to look up, find the time to check in with yourself, find the time to give yourself that pep talk that you need, right? And to be, talk, speak to yourself like you would um, a close loved one. Conducting after action reviews when stuff goes sideways um, is a good best practice. Um, it's often uncomfortable because we don't want to think about the things that went wrong. We just want to move on. But if we don't take that as an opportunity to learn, now we're creating a toxic and more dysfunctional workplace. So um, these are things that can help us understand, again, what can be controlled and what cannot. Okay. So external influences have impacted a lot of us personally, right? So if you are someone who has experienced trauma or you are from an underrepresented population or you have something in your past that then you have to deal with at work, you need to give yourself the space to understand the weight of dealing with that work. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you or you're not qualified to do your job. You can be really good at your job and still have emotional needs. And I thought that uh, this next person, she articulated it pretty well. I'll go back to 2020, um, unpacking a pandemic. I was in the healthcare field, unpacking a pandemic, un uh, unpacking uh, the, the murder of George Floyd. I worked really, really hard early in my career to make sure that I separated that girl from the South with that PTSD from what I experienced growing up with the work that I was doing in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. This is a business case. This is my personal experience. Well, guess what? crash. So now professional Kim is impacted, right? How do I deal with that? And it, this has been a real journey. I've never had to deal with that before. I've never felt like crying in a meeting at work before. I've never realized how much um, I took on other people's pain, you know, and, and between the pain and, and sitting through incident command, trying to watch healthcare disparities and how we're going to address that. I was exhausted. And, and I, just how she articulates that, I think, is really poignant for us to pay attention when we're feeling that way, because uh, you're in the danger zone and it's time for you to spend some time listening to yourself and understanding the work we do can be very difficult, right? Um, and so giving ourselves space to understand that, giving ourselves the grace and kindness to navigate that in the way that we need is important. So I want you to think about what are those triggers for you? What are those things that you already know are going to be difficult and build a plan, right? Know that this conversation is going to be tough and I need to do X for me. Um, try to build in time for open discussion within your HR team. Well, yeah, let, let's talk about it. Let, let's put it out there. Let's have those conversations. You're not, maybe not changing anything, but you are finding ways to cope with difficult situations. Uh, what are some other environmental influences? So I talked about, um, there's industry, there's uh, different things happening out in the world, uh, in our society in general that impact us. Anybody uh, want to share other things that maybe impact them from a, both within their their company space, but also outside.
Yes, attrition, people leaving. Yeah, absolutely. And that high war for talent, if you're in recruiting right now and you're trying to get those, those resources, um, that can be very, very stressful, right? Not something we can change a lot. We get creative. Uh, how do we creative? We create psychological safety. Thank you, Renee. All right. So finally, and this is what people tend to hyper-focus on is expectations of behavior. So I'm going to go through those very quickly. Um, what I want us to pay attention to in HR is expectations of behavior around of the emotional labor that we give to the teams. But here are some things to pay attention to as well. When organizations um, are, you know, come across as impersonal, have high control, uh, focusing only on failures or inconsistent, someone mentioned favoritism, all of those have been documented by the World Health Organizations as ways in which we undermine the mental health of our workforce. If you have that happening, either within your team or with the people you partner with, be aware of it and build a plan to help mitigate that risk for you in 2023, right? And here um, are some ways that you can do that. I'm going to skip the emotional over here for a second. Um, oh, but, 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 but we're going to, we'll cover that in another one. Um, so focusing on failures. In HR, we have a lot on the line. When we make mistakes, there are huge consequences. And so that can create a level of emotional exhaustion that we need to pay attention to. So things like masking and feeling like we have to be somebody that we're not having to be on all the time, that can increase our, um, our emotional exhaustion uh, exponentially. The other thing is when we perceive ourselves as having to be perfect and be the model for everyone all the time, that also increases um, our stress. All right, so finally, all right, so we've talked about some things you can do throughout. Here are four specific things that you can do for 2023. Number one, use a framework. Use something like DACI. Use the, the C model to look at, use something you can kind of um, anchor to that will help give you a structure in how you plan for the year, right? Use these tools and resources to help you think about what are my goals for 2023? What do I want to achieve for me and for my team to thrive and be healthy? Look for signs of all those hazards we've spoken about and we're recording so you'll be able to see what those are. If you want, again, the WHO has those hazards listed. The ISO has those listed. They talk about what it looks like. We all know what it looks like, right? When we have dysfunction and hazards on the team, this is what we do for a living. Look for the signs that things are going sideways and come up with ways we can mitigate and address them. Engage your leadership. If you're the leader of your team, you know, build the team that you want to work for um, and then work with others within the organization to help create more growth around psychological health within the company. And honestly, just get started. Um, you know, the best place to start is now. So just take little steps. Th these are not going to be big changes you're going to be able to make overnight, but little steps, little steps of I understand, you know, maybe being clear about roles, being clear about how, um, yeah, what if the leader doesn't want to deal with hazards and dysfunction? Um, then two choices. Uh, what can you do to make that a survivable space for you? And then if not, then what's your what's your what's your next plan? Um, and so that can help you decide what action you want to take. Right? What what's the action that's going to work for you? All right, so our goal today was to give you a bunch of things to think about on how you have the best year ever um, by creating a psychologically healthy workplace, control what you can control, accept what you cannot, um, and uh, make sure that you've really looked at what your needs are um, as you head into 2023. With that, I'll open up to any questions, comments, Thank you, Juliet. Thank you for also being on camera for me. <laughs> and, and Jennifer. Uh, yes, thank you. And is that Maria? Am I saying that right? Okay. I probably said that completely wrong.
Dr. Al, thank you so much. Uh, to reinforce, thank you for taking the time to go through all of these uh, really interesting and certainly important points of things that we don't think about. Please know, everybody, you're definitely not alone that um, as I don't know, let her talk a little bit more to her uh, connection screen here, connect with everybody. You're not alone in doing this. We're here to support one another. Absolutely. And that's the best place to start is by connecting, coming to things like this. Thinking about yourself for just an hour, what do I need to be successful this year? And yes, feel free to connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also on TikTok um, as Dr. Al Polizzi, where I post on your HR as your HR big sister, um, but it's mostly on all things mental health at work. Thank you so much again for joining us, everyone, today. Dr. Al, thank you so much for your time. Uh, certainly look forward to seeing all of you again soon. I will definitely make sure to send out the summary that I'll have the recording and slides on it as well. Everybody have a great rest of your day and have a fantastic weekend. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.